It's a great honor to be here to share uh, some of my experiences in the past 30 years. I think it's very interesting to talk at the Indianapolis about uh, uh, challenges and uh, imposed face actually by the Chinese uh, community, Chinese society, as well as here in uh, communities in general. But to start with, actually, you know, today there are also there's a called the dialogue going on. It is a called strategic dialogue of economics between uh, China's delegation led by the Vice Premier and the Treasury Secretary Paulson at the uh, represent the uh, administration here in the U.S. Okay, so a lot of issues are brought up in this dialogue as energy, uh, as the collaboration, as the RMB's value. Okay. Of course, we will talk about this and the, between the two governments and government officials talk about that. The many issues are facing actually both nations. For instance, energy issue, right? uh, energy issue. Of course, some may say, well, that we have facing four dollar plus uh, gas price. Some of the reasons because there are too many uh, Chinese now starting driving cars, right? As indeed, uh, the brick that car produced by uh, General Motors, actually the best seller uh, in China market. Okay, as many of my colleagues driving this uh, round, come and back forth to their home and work. Okay, but let's think about this moment, right? But think about 30 years ago. This year, 2008, is also an anniversary of 30 years of economic reform and open door policy. In 1978, China started its economic reform, as you have read about this in the billionaire, billions of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs uh, in China. Okay. And in China, people think about that. What do we have done? What do we have passed in the last 30 years? What do we have achieved? What have we missed? Okay. Actually, uh, for a moment, McKinsey also launched a product but what will happen in the next 30 years, in 2038? Okay, actually, I'm in the panel right, to, to uh, uh, work with McKinsey to explore that what will happen down the road in the next 30 years. Okay. Of course, we know now, it's, of course, after the 30 years, indeed, actually, my, my, my basic training is the, uh, economic, the economics. Now, they take a, people talk about in the human history and it never be. Uh, in the, such a short period, and with such massive population involved, with such sustained, sustained economic growth that China has experienced in the last 30 years. But of course, it poses enormous challenges. Okay, and to, I think, combined with, with India and Russia and other changes. For instance, we are going to talk about that uh, uh, medical care, health care. Actually, in China as well, I think, in, 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 I mean, within China, the police circles, and uh, it happened to be at my school, we have a department of healthcare economic, healthcare economics and management. Okay. And people think about, of course, we, in Chinese, generally speaking, the living standard has been raising steadily. Okay. And of course, in terms of RMB, RMB in the past 22 years had appreciated 20% right, against a US dollar. But there's one very weak link. Some say it's complete failure. It is healthcare system. Okay. Uh, in the last 30 years, essentially, China, from very central plant, we call it what we could call socialist or communist system, embarked to the market system. Okay. But in that period, the healthcare, particularly the public healthcare, is, was not in the top of priority. Okay, that is, now, today, after 30 years, and people face that challenge. But the issue is how can we do from here? Okay. Another issue I think also today we're going to talk about that is that in the, before the reform, China was isolated. Not only isolated by external forces, but internally also isolated. Very isolated. The very good example to show is you know, in May 12th, there were very strong earthquake taking place at the center of China, Sichuan province. 
Now the casualties, the, the death toll is about uh, close to 70,000 people, right? That, that very good comparison is about 30 years ago, just before China and its Cultural Revolution entering the market oriented reform, there were also an uh, earthquake, compatible on scale, but more casualty. At that time, a quarter million people died. But I, I was interviewed by some uh, TV uh, uh, journalists, I would compare the two. In 1976, that was 1976, right? 30 years, roughly 30 years, 30, 20 years ago, China was hit by a quake, by the earthquake that caused about a quarter million people death. death. And the international community tried to rush to help. And then, what's the response? Just, no. No, we just, we could, they call self-alliances, self-alliance, okay? They have to, actually, in my reflection, actually at that time, the mentality is internally, not only externally, at that time, people trying to help. The internally Chinese want to isolate, keep itself isolated. We're not so much confident. Okay? After 30 years, after the economic reform and the political system gradually reform, and so, so society also reformed. And the government, as well as the individual citizens, gain some confidence. Right? They are open to the outside world. So then that means earthquake hit this time after 30 years. And Chinese government and Chinese community and welcome and call for help from international community. Right? And, uh, and the U.S. government and the U.S. Uh, Red Cross uh, donated about uh, the number of millions of dollars of goods and aids. So that is, uh, we compare the two of the cases before and just before and after the 30 years of the economic reform. Of course, in the meantime, that's also created a lot of business opportunities. A lot of, business. of course, people say, well, it's a good made in China with the euro take up jobs, but indeed, but then how can you, you can imagine, suppose, uh, without uh, China, the economic reform, without the changes in India and Russia, probably the world may be uh, not as good as what we are experiencing today. Of, of course, there's a lot of challenges in front of us. Okay, that's why we are sitting here to talk about what the challenges are and how can we cope with challenges, explore the opportunities, and not only here, but also in as far as uh, uh, China. Okay, uh, to some extent, it's not that far nowadays with that uh, uh, globalized society. Okay, this is my fourth trip to, to the States. Actually, uh, two weeks ago, I ho hosted a group of MBA students from uh, this campus, okay, led by uh, one uh, Madri Lyons and one professor here. Actually, this is the third time I uh, welcome this visiting students, MBA students, uh, to Pe at Peking University. Uh, actually, last previous two years, I also uh, uh, such tour as a group of visit companies and doing something. That's always my uh, opening remarks. Okay. So welcome. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's probably my first uh, entry into the business school. I'm very impressed with the facilities that you have. What we share in uh, Ballantyne Hall, where the criminal justice is located in Bloomington campus is not even a patch on what we have here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to share some uh, uh, thoughts about India and uh, leave most of the judgment to uh, uh, distinguished uh, people that we have in this room. Uh, if I have to say anything about India, then I think the first thought that uh, comes to my mind is that it's a democracy. And uh, as a democratic nation of uh, more than a billion people, extremely diverse in almost every respect from ethnicity, culture, language, religion, whatever, um, uh, adjective you may have, uh, it's uh, uh, a, a, a therefore almost a unique country uh, um, uh, um, in many ways, and in many ways it's fairly similar 
to United States because United States also is a large democratic nation with very diverse um, uh, people. As a democracy, uh, uh, there are certain institutions uh, that uh, form the pillar of uh, pillars of democracy, and uh, India too has them. Uh, there is, uh, of course, the elected parliament and, and uh, legislative assemblies for different states, and we also have a third tier, which is uh, at the village level, a panchayat institution, uh, a village council, uh, which also uh, is now known as a third tier of uh, uh, lawmaking. Uh, most significantly, uh, we have an extremely active and independent uh, judiciary. Uh, <clears throat> there is a, com uh, a free media, uh, very com uh, combative, and, uh, 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 and, and uh, pursues almost any um, issue uh, very, very uh, diligently. Talking about this uh, uh, judiciary, the Indian Supreme Court um, is perhaps one of the most active Supreme Courts anywhere in the world. Um, and as an illustration, I, I'd like to share uh, a mechanism that Supreme Court uh, developed to address uh, a variety of issues in the country. In uh, mid-1970s, uh, two Supreme Court judges um, uh, decided in a judgment that um, since Supreme Court is uh, really the custodian of uh, human rights for the citizens, uh, and the government is not addressing them, and the mechanism for a citizen to seek grieve, uh, redressal of their grievances through the courts is very complex and, and uh, time-consuming. A shortcut or a, a different mechanism has to be evolved. So the Supreme Court evolved a mechanism which has now come to be known as public interest litigation, which uh, uh, in practical terms simply means that any citizen or any concerned citizen concerned about some issue that uh, affects uh, citizen rights can approach the Supreme Court directly to uh, seek an intervention. And this um, uh, approach can be by mere letter. So uh, citizens can write a letter to the Supreme Court um, uh, uh, judges and demand that, well, they have some problem and, the, and, the, and they need a Supreme Court intervention. And this has happened. Millions and millions of uh, letters have been written to the Supreme Court, and at least thousands and thousands uh, of such letters have been addressed by the Supreme Court, which uh, in the past 30, 35 years have led to some very, very far-reaching uh, uh, impact in terms of governance and in terms of holding government accountable. Uh, <clears throat> The other part, and I'm, I'm going to uh, touch uh, uh, some implications of PIL when I come to uh, a few of my examples. The other part of our democracy is uh, also that uh, democracy uh, uh, means a rule of law. Uh, it means a, a, a constitutional guarantee, which is there in ample evidence in India. Um, for example, there is a right of, of course, association, freedom of speech, and movement, and fall, you can follow any religion and on and on, all the rights that uh, perhaps uh, uh, we see out here, um, which obviously means that uh, you cannot uh, deny citizens, for, say, for example, moving from one place to another uh, <clears throat> for any kind of uh, uh, pursuit that they have in mind, uh, which obviously uh, translates into g growth of slums or uh, uh, very heavily populated uh, metropolitan cities, which just cannot be controlled, as perhaps uh, you know, uh, we see that in, 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 in China. But that also means that um, uh, uh, in a variety of ways, the um, citizens can form different interest groups and uh, uh, dem make demands upon the government. And ultimately, government or go uh, governance uh, or legislative uh, uh, work has to take into account all these millions and millions of voices that cannot be curbed, with the result that any policy making has to take into account a vast variety of interest groups that are operating in the country. So therefore, it has to be very, very craft, um, uh, um, carefully crafted and very, very carefully implemented, because if you upset any particular group, then your next election, um, uh, you, you may see an adverse uh, result. Now, this has meant that uh, policy making and policy em enforcement uh, has been very, very tardy and, and slow, and of course, you know, we keep on sort of uh, complaining, uh, everyone keeps on complaining that government is just not able to make up its mind. Uh, 
A very um, a clear example which happened recently was uh, the rise in fuel prices. Uh, the fuel uh, in India is distributed, uh, distributed by a, a public sector uh, 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 undertaking, uh, and the price is controlled by the government. Despite all the prices going up uh, internationally, the government of India could not bring itself to raise the fuel price uh, simply because uh, you know, an election is due next year and it, ha it, it would have uh, very adverse uh, ramifications. It has raised, uh, but only to a small extent. Uh, <clears throat> the other part is that when the Supreme Court um, uh, um, uh, is um, uh, holding the government uh, uh, um, accountable in a variety of ways, and very new mechanisms have emerged. One such is now known as Right to Information Act. Uh, uh, some citizen groups approach the Supreme Court demanding that the government um, uh, functions under a cloud and we can't get the, all the information. And uh, as a democracy, we, the citizens have a right to all the information. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, that looks like a good idea. And they um, gave a judgment which impl uh, forced the, ultimately forced the government to enact a law. So now there is a Right to Information Act, which has been used in a vast variety of ways. Uh, for example, um, demanding to know how development funds uh, are being utilized, or how much was paid to a, 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 a village hospital, and um, you know how much was spent on medicine, and how much on treatment, and on and on. And this obviously forced um, uh, doctors who are uh, working there to become more, more uh, accountable. Uh, in my own sphere, um, uh, <clears throat> police um, uh, and the criminal justice system uh, has been one which has been continuing from, a, from the British period. In fact, India con, um, continues to bear a lot of colonial legacy in, in that particular sense, because most of the bureaucracy and the uh, legal system have, were those that were devised during the colonial period. Um, there have been demands, and uh, in, um, uh, in a way, uh, uh, democracy has been throwing those voices, so many changes have been uh, forthcoming. But an interesting um, aspect of that is that the colonial model has been forced to accommodate uh, the democratic voices and the democratic functioning. Thus, for example, the police, which uh, was a very coercive instrument during the British period, the same police now has to function under a implied system of accountability where uh, any strong action against any group or any particular citizen can uh, lead to a lot of questions um, and, 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 and therefore holds the uh, um, police officers accountable. Uh, <clears throat> let me um, uh, uh, <clears throat> give two examples. Uh, the police department uh, 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 as an organization, unfortunately, uh, as I said, is still under the colonial legacy and, and this does not seem to be a system of local accountability. But uh, again, uh, the openness of the system, the, the PIL, the, uh, the, the intervention by the Supreme Court, and the various uh, uh, media highlights have forced the police department to hold accountability in a variety of ways. Uh, <clears throat> one such is that uh, you know, uh, uh, almost any um, uh, investigation or uh, any inquiry done by the police or any even um, uh, major arrest uh, has to be explained in, in, in some pu public forum, which uh, makes the officers uh, accountable. Secondly, a very large number of uh, uh, non-governmental organizations and interest groups have emerged, which in their own way uh, uh, demand such kind of an accountability. Uh, Professor Madhanraj was mentioning one that, uh, with which I'm associated. We have, we have uh, introduced, uh, we have uh, started a group called saferindia.com, where essentially we invite the citizens to bring any complaints against the police officers and then we uh, take them to the highest officials and pursue them so that uh, uh, those uh, grievances can be uh, redressed. Uh, very recently the Supreme Court again acting on a public interest litigation uh, has directed the government and forced the government to enact an, a new law to change this colonial uh, uh, model of, of policing in, in, uh, in the country. So I think in, in, a, in, in such uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, uh, democracy is forcing the government and the government officials to become accountable. On the other hand, um, decision making is getting uh, seriously affected 
and uh, there is a considerable amount of delay in, uh, in taking uh, uh, major decisions. The good part of that is that whenever a decision is taken, uh, it has a very large base of support. Uh, so that even if a new political party comes into power, uh, it's unlikely to change uh, uh, the course radically. So for example, the foreign policy of India or the economic policy of India or uh, the notion that there should be a democratic polity in the way the uh, uh, democracy and the constitutionalism should operate in the country has much wider consensus. So even if we have a communist party that comes into West Bengal or Kerala or a right-wing party that comes into um, uh, some particular state, most of these policies will remain intact. So the economic policy that uh, finally evolved in 1991, which is uh, very similar to what is happening in China, is likely to continue now for almost, um, uh, you know, till some, uh, again, a, ma a major radical change may come through. But no political party is likely to disrupt that particular uh, process. So I think that is a, a measure of a lot of stability in the country uh, that uh, one can foresee. Okay.